Hi guys, welcome back to the channel for another video. And it hasn't been three months. <laughs> it's only been like three weeks. Uh, just back to do a little bit of a catch up Q&A, recovery questions, personal questions, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so happy to be back into the swing of things talking to you guys, which we'll get a little bit into with some of the questions that you asked. Just got done recording with Carolyn Coston. That video slash podcast will be up next week. So video form will be up here, but it will also be a Beyond Body podcast episode. So make sure you are following over on Spotify and Apple, all those links below. There's some really good stuff coming up, especially some great interviews, pre-recorded stuff. So let's get into the questions you guys sent me over on Instagram. Hi Mia, hope you're doing well. What have you been up to lately? How is life going? So obviously when people take a bit of time away from social media, it's usually because something's gone wrong or they need a mental health break. And I've certainly done that before. And it was kind of really the reverse this time. It was for very positive reasons. Uh, and uh, we went into lockdown here in Australia late June. I was very lucky to be able to get down here with my family on the South Coast. We had the surf and the sand and the bushland rather than, you know, built up Sydney, which was a very tense place to be. And I uh, was just lucky to be able to do it with my family. But for whatever reason, I just started to do things like write creatively. I started learning guitar. I still am. I'm still terrible at it, but I love it. I was, you know, getting out into nature and I just really started to properly take time for myself and realized how much I had not done that in such a long time. And it felt so amazing. I felt like I was really for the first time in a long time coming back to myself properly. And I just really wanted to protect that and cherish it. Uh, I was having these immense waves of overwhelm in terms of how just like peaceful and joyful and hopeful I felt. And it was overwhelming because I don't realize how little of that I had felt for the last couple of years. And it just felt incredibly healing and amazing. And I know that sounds very woo-woo and I am a cynical, non very woo-woo person, but that's the only way I can describe it, which is why I made that I'm awake video. I was trying to capture that feeling uh, that I still have trouble putting into words how amazing it was and is to come home to yourself and to come back online again. Uh, so that's really what I was trying to capture in that video. Uh, so life is really good. Uh, there was still stuff happening behind the scenes. I still have my superstar coach in LA Shelby. I've just hired another coach, another superstar, Anne Claire out of uh, Belgium. Uh, oh, there's been a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes. Life is really good, uh, but I just really uh, instinctively needed to put my attention into some other stuff uh, for the time being. And uh, it naturally made me want to come back, right? I don't think you can force things. It's what I teach people in recovery. If you actually give yourself time out, you'll get back to the things you need to do sooner because you're not forcing it, right? You're not pressuring yourself. So thanks for bearing with me. But I'm also very unapologetic for the fact that I 100% don't regret it and I would do it same way all over again. This is a great one. Have your relationships gotten deeper and stronger since starting recovery or being recovered? Absolutely, they have. I think that most people who've gone through this process would attest to the fact that recovery and also being recovered absolutely strengthens your connection to other people because particularly if you recover in the way that I did in the way that I coach others to, connection to other people is such an integral part of how we crowd out the eating disorder part of us, that instead of reaching out to the eating disorder, that we reach out to other people. In order to maintain and protect your eating disorder, in part, you have to be isolated, secretive, in some ways dishonest, potentially even using some kind of manipulative behavior. Uh, I know that I'm speaking for myself there, not accusing anyone of anything, but that was certainly what I did. I think it'd be very, very hard to find anyone maintaining an eating disorder who is also having a totally honest, present, fulfilling relationship with anyone, whether it's parents, partners, friends, whomever. There is a certain amount of compromise and sacrifice when you have an eating disorder present. So absolutely, it was almost immediate, especially with my family, because they suspected that there was stuff that was wrong, even if they didn't know specifically the source. And I think they were greatly relieved. And 
I had lost a lot of my friendships temporarily, but I had really distanced myself from my core friendships, my best lifelong friends, because of I couldn't maintain my eating disorder and those friendships, particularly, you know, I have friends who are very, very honest with me and they would be very honest with me about my behavior and about my uh, way of treating myself and I chose in to be honest I chose my eating disorder over a lot of people and a lot of friendships I was very lucky that those people so willingly and enthusiastically came back with open arms and I was able to repair every single one of those relationships that speaks to the depth of connection that I experience now versus before I have such a deeper sense of gratitude for those friendships and any new connections because I had nothing. I I had no one by the time I went into recovery. I'd made it extraordinarily difficult for people to be in my life. How do I know recovery will be worth it? Blunt answer, you won't. Uh, In terms of your own anecdotal assurance, uh, you won't until you do it and you start to see incrementally the evidence that life is absolutely better without an eating disorder, even just with less of an eating disorder as it recedes. You can definitely see it in other people. There's a reason why I say, and so many recovered people say that, you know, you won't find a recovered person who regrets being recovered or who would choose their eating disorder life over their recovered life. But in terms of your guarantee that your life will be, you know, that it will be worth it. I mean, it's pretty statistically unlikely that you're going to be the one recovered person who is like going to be like this is such a scam that's just not it's not really uh just from a logical rational perspective um take fear out of it it's just statistically really unlikely but i think people want guarantees people want guarantees like this is going to happen and that's definitely going to happen and you're going to be just so happy at this point and at the six month mark this is going to happen to you that's just not the nature of recovery And it has to be that way because that's not the nature of life. You have to be in your life and willing to ride out the difficult parts and the challenging parts in order to fully appreciate like the unreal, wonderful, euphoric, amazing moments. Eating disorders are rigid uh, and they are terrible, but they're predictable. And that's why we find them comfortable. I've talked about this before that, you know, an eating disorder, even in its most abusive, torturous, punitive phases or versions are comforting for people because they are predictable. The patterns are the same. The behaviors are the same. The thoughts are the same. The days are the same. You, you're not going to be surprised by an eating disorder because you know, it's always going to be terrible. Life isn't always terrible. But it's unpredictable in that it is like this, right? And that's what recovery is like because that is what you're building up resilience for to be able to deal with life. Recovery is a crash course on how to live, to be honest. Uh, And that means that the only controllable variable is how you treat yourself and how you take care of yourself. And that alone is worth it. Learning how to do that and to be able to withstand anything is worth it, you know, like I said, I was just talking to Carolyn and I've told her many times that I knew I was fully recovered before I had the worst eight months of my life where my dad died of cancer and I saw him in a terrible state before he died, then came home and my hometown was on fire and our house was under threat from bushfires. And then I found my grandmother passed away in her home and that was all in the space of seven months. And that's terrible. But I took care of myself through all of it, not with an eating disorder, with the help of my loved ones, with all the skills that I learned in recovery. And I knew for sure. And I told Carolyn this, oh, if anyone doubts full recovery, like give them my email. Like (laughs) if I did not, not just relapse, but collapse because of that experience, I don't know why I just said collapse that way, but recovery apparently can't help uh, your enunciation. You've got to be in it to win it. Once you get in, you'll figure out it's worth it. What triggers your Christmas nostalgia? Anyone who's been here for long enough knows that I am an absolute fiend for Christmas. I don't know what it is, but I, since I was a kid, have always loved Christmas. We weren't like a really big Christmassy family. Mum and I have become like fanatics with like the decorations and the lead up and the preparation. But since I was a kid, I just love it. There's a lot like seeing we in our street, 
uh, in our town, our town over the, our street in our town over the years has become like the street with all, like the crazy Griswold level lights. So definitely when our uh, street starts to turn into like the Christmas version of Las Vegas, for sure. I literally just wandered around. I put the bins out last night and just wandered up and down the street, just like, this is heaven. What is your opinion on how harmful the diagnosis of atypical anorexia is? I think we've got to listen to people. I don't think it's so much for me to say that it's harmful. I think we've got to listen to the people who've been given that uh, label and how unproductive it's been for them and how alienating it's been for them. That's what I've heard from clients who have received that diagnosis. I think we've got to remember that a diagnosis can be very, very validating and is very, very important depending on the individual. For some people, it may not be. For others, it will be. In terms of my work, I meet every single client where they are, regardless of their diagnosis uh, I'm more interested in their mindset in their behaviors in their level of suffering in how we can help them to uh, navigate their lives and their recovery in a way that's effective and productive I don't spend too much time harping on uh, diagnosis but that's not to say that I don't think it's important I think it is but it's not the whole story in one way I think that people want to People want the specificity of a diagnosis, but then we also want to eradicate the specificity of eating disorder diagnoses and kind of just meet everyone on the level that they need to be met on in terms of like them as an individual. And I've, that's kind of where I sit. I, I absolutely don't think atypical anorexia is, you know, I think that anorexia is anorexia regardless of body size, etc. Uh, I don't know why that's controversial in terms of my work that I do. I'm like, let's get in there, right? We can talk about labels all day, but uh, let's do the work to get you out of the suffering. I'm more interested in like helping people get away from the suffering. Favorite food you rediscovered? I think chocolate was a really big one for me to go and like just buy myself chocolate with nothing else. Like to go, I feel like chocolate. So I'm going up the road and I'm buying chocolate and not being like and I'll like make it part of my groceries or make it part of a behavior it was just like I just going up the road to get chocolate and that felt so cool like at 25 I was like oh my god I, I can buy myself chocolate isn't that so indicative of like how rigid and um, punishing eating disorders are as an adult woman that would just seem like so rebellious to me uh, but in terms of meals probably crumbed cutlets that's a big thing in my family uh it's a very big comfort food it's what my mum makes me when I'm you know feeling a bit sooky and needing some TLC my grand grand used to make it for my sister and I uh when we go and visit all the time like she would just have a freezer full of them um so that was big that was like big nostalgia vibes and a beautiful thing to return to how do you redefine your identity post recovery find who you are without your ad I am of the opinion that that is something we work on through recovery. We don't really amputate an eating disorder and an eating disorder identity and then like have this vacuum, you know, this soulless, empty person. I tend to see it that the genuine, authentic, like healthy self part of you is being repressed by the eating disorder self. It's like pushing it down and squashing it down, kind of like a jack in the box. And as we need the eating disorder less and less it takes up less and less room and we make it you know more and more redundant that healthy part of you starts to come up uh, and starts to take up more room and wants more connection and more creativity and more you know adventure and passion and and sometimes we've got to you know get people to do that I do that with clients where they get a bit scared to pursue that and and uh, explore that uh, but I've set them challenges around that. Like you're going to take yourself off to the movies this week or like, why don't we try this lesson or why don't you go and do A, B, C or D? Let's just experiment with it. Or what did you love doing as a kid? Let's start there. And they're like, I'm not going to love what I loved doing as a kid. I'm like, I loved creative writing. I loved making up stories. I still love doing that now. You know, I loved singing. I'm not very good at it, but I loved singing. I still love doing that now. I love learning a song and belting it out when no one will ever hear me. So you've got to go looking for clues from, you know, a healthy part of you that may have existed before and build on it by getting curious about who might 
you know, how you might add to that. I personally think it's a really exciting thing to do. I understand why people can be anxious or a bit resistant to that. Um, but I don't want people to think that like your eating disorder just gets taken away from you and nothing's left, particularly in like the approach that I work with. It's more that you just suddenly start going, I don't need this eating disorder thing anymore, right? We crowd out the true you until that eating disorder self part of you just is out of a job, right? So it's it's less that it's like day one, eating disorder, day two, empty person, right? If you could say anything to teenage Mia, what would you say? <laughs> Depends on the age. Like young teenage Mia, I would just say nothing wrong with your body, like nothing wrong with you as a person. Teenage boys suck. This is all going to make sense in the long run. You know, you're going to do something really, really powerful with what you're experiencing now that's, you know, really, really hard. Late teenage Mia, I'd say pull your head in. <laughs> Um, no, I was, I was a very happy teen, like from 16 to 18. I, I, you know, life was really good. Um, but I was pretty, I was pretty headstrong. Um, no kidding, but should come as a surprise to no one. Since getting to the point of fully recovered, have you ever been tempted to use behaviors again? No, sort of throw back to what I said earlier in the video, um, have been through the hardest, things in my life. Uh, I used to say that recovery was the hardest thing I've ever done. Nope. Uh, that seven month period was endless tsunamis of grief and challenge and sadness and can't put into words what that time of my life was like. And there was no temptation at all. Uh, there has not been. And that's, that speaks to the power of neuroplasticity. We can change our brains. We can change how they respond to stress, loss, major events. Um, and we just have so many people now saying that's the case. You know, that's the power of lived experience. Spoiler alert for next week's video. How do you fight the ED when nobody is there to keep you accountable? I have no help. You have you. You are there to keep you accountable. Uh, trust me, I see people with all different kinds of treatment setups. The help is great. Don't get me wrong. If you have help, you're very lucky. But no one can make you do anything that you are not ultimately accountable to yourself for. I have people who come into work with me thinking I'm going to be a magic bullet that I'm going to be able to incentivize them in some magical way or hold them accountable in some magical way. I can't. Nobody can. Uh, you can be given frameworks and skills. And there is, I mean, accountability in the sense that someone else will know but the most important person who knows whether you are doing or not doing what you need to do in this process is you i had a psychologist i was living out of home i didn't have anybody to keep me accountable either i would cook every meal make every snack nobody else did my mum lived down on the south coast three hours away uh my dad lived in massachusetts i was accountable to myself you know when you're not doing what you need to be doing. And ultimately, if we can't reach the point where we are taking ownership of this process and we are accountable to ourselves, I truly believe there's a limit as to how far we can go. If you are doing it because someone else is holding you accountable, then you are relying on an external source of motivation. And that can be helpful, but it's not consistent. It's not as consistent as you doing it for you and monitoring and holding yourself accountable. I see people with all different kinds of treatment setups who have the whole gamut, every sort of treatment box ticked. And unless they are accountable here, it has a limit to how much it can help. That's the truth. So what I would suggest is if you haven't explored the eight keys uh, books by Carolyn Coston, Carolyn's getting a real uh, little uh, name check today. <laughs> She's on my brain because we just spoke. But of course, it's the one it's the one resource I recommend to everyone because it teaches you this, that the fight is between you and you. Favorite song on Red, Taylor's version. Obviously, all too well, 10 minute version. I haven't stopped listening to it. It still brings me to tears. It tells the story of my 20s uh, and that one person who we all should never have fallen in love with. Uh, but it's nice to look back on that period of my life from my thirties going, honey, <laughs> you want to talk red? Let's talk about red flags. Like 
get out of there, sunshine. Um, but yeah, it's she's. I am. I'm a very proud Swifty. Have been for like over 13 years. And how much weight did you gain? I'm not touching that. Don't ask people that, guys. It, even if somebody answers. That information is not helpful to you. It's not going to support you. It's not going to get you where you need to go. The question is, why are you asking that question? So that's all I can get to before my phone dies. It is on 1%. I'm so sorry for anyone who is made anxious by that information. I am one of those people who lets their phone get to 1%. Uh, But I hope that I got to a few uh, that you might have been helped by. There are a few double ups, so apologies if I didn't get to yours. Like I said, next week will be the video with Carolyn, also featuring a couple of my coaches talking about the power of lived experience. It will also be a podcast episode. Uh, and I think that's really all I have to update you on. We're just back. We're just doing stuff. We're just releasing, you know, months of content that I've had saved on my computer. Much love. Take care. I definitely remembered that that's what I used to say at the end of my videos. (laughs) I'll see you guys next week.